Good afternoon. Um, my name is Mark Gracie. Um, I'll be running through this uh, webinar. Um, it should last about 30 to 40 minutes and we'll have some time for some questions at the end. In your control panel um, for the GoToWebinar software you should see a question section. You can type your, your questions in there and we'll try and pick those up. I, I've also had a few emailed uh, questions in, in advance um, and I'll pick up on some of those if um, we don't cover them during the talk. Um, so. This webinar is going to be about um, the general data protection regulation and uh, the impact it has on, on marketing. Um, hopefully everybody can hear me and um, I can see the slides on the screen. Um, I'm just going to quickly flip over to a slide of myself. Um, so just to explain, um, I run a business called Flavify Digital and um, a service that I, I offer called the Digital Compliance Hub, which I'll talk about um, towards the end. Um, my background um, is uh, in internet and telecoms regulation and an element of that was actually being a data protection officer for um, some internet companies um, back when the uh, Data Protection Act became law. Um, so I very much uh, uh, get involved in, in law and regulation and um, I'm working with businesses on uh, everything to do with GDPR at the moment, anything from uh, sort of one-off consultancy through to um, carrying out audits in preparation for the general data protection regulation. So what we're going to talk about is GDPR compliance and, and how that impacts on, on marketing. So I'm, I'm hoping that by the end of this session you'll, you'll get a, a feel for um, an overview of the GDPR, an overview of how the GDPR impacts on, on uh, marketing and, um, and then hopefully you'll have a, some thoughts about whether it applies to you and if so um, whether you need to worry about it, and if you do, um, what you might be able to do to uh, get yourself um, heading in the right direction with um, being uh, compliant when the regulation comes into force um, next year. But for, first of all, I just want to talk about marketing compliance because in, in the realms of, of marketing, as I'm sure um, uh, uh, a lot of you already know, there there's certain rules that um, dictate what we can and can't do with data for the purposes of marketing. And essentially, there's, there's two elements to that. That's your data protection. Um, so the rules which are currently in force in the UK as a Data Protection Act um, that set out um, what you can and can't do. And the primary driver under data protection is the consent for the purposes of marketing. Um, and um, the other side of it is also the privacy regulation. So we have the privacy electronic communication regulations which stipulate what you can and can't do with, with marketing. Um, uh, specifically, they tie together, so the Data Protection Act and the Privacy Electronic Communication Regulations both work together to essentially set up a regime of marketing compliance in the UK. Um, and we'll come back to this towards the end because there's some changes that will also uh, impact on, on the rules relating to, to marketing um, and in the privacy um, regulations as well. So it's probably worth just um, Recapping, um, in case there's any doubt, when, when we talk about data protection, what are we talking about? Well, we're talking about the processing and use of personal data, um, where personal data is defined as data relating to a living individual rather than a, a, a business entity. Um, we'll, I'll talk in a minute about actually there's a few exceptions to that, but generally speaking, it's, it's living individuals' data. Um, and data protection is all about making sure that the data that you store, you process, you make use of, um, uh, is, is looked after, is, is not processed unfairly, is, um, is kept up to date, um, is, is stored securely, um, is, is not retained any longer than you have a reason to, to, to um, store it, and, um, and data protection rules also set out things like individuals' rights. That probably the most common one is data subject access request, which enables the data subject, the person whose data it is, to um, ask uh, uh, an organization to tell them what data they store about them and, and how they use it. Um, and there's also rules around the international transfer of data and how, what happens if your data is um, sent to a processor and, and um, a, a processed in a, in a country outside the EU, um, for, for example. So, um, so that's, that's in essence is what data protection is about. Just three key definitions that's always worth bearing in mind um, when it comes to data protection. You have your data subject, which is the person whose data it is that you're, um, uh, you're processing or, or um, using. Data controller, which is the organization that's collecting the data from the data subject and, and doing something with it. Um, and a data processor, 
who is a, which may be the same as a controller, but it's the actual processing of the data for specific purposes. But you can have third parties who um, will be processing data on behalf of the data controller. Um, and it's quite worth bearing those in mind because um, there's, there's some relevance to that uh, coming up in a, in a second. Um, so as I said, data protection is about personal data, data relating to a living individual, but actually in, in the B2B environment, um, there are certain elements of business data which is also considered personal data. Um, for certain types of businesses, sole traders for example, that their data is considered personal data and not business data and therefore if you are processing data relating to sole traders then you have to make sure you apply the data protection rules as though they're uh, an individual, not, um, not as a, a business. And, and also, um, a, a personal email address within a, a business is personal data within it in itself, um, even though it's a business email address and therefore data protection rules apply to that as well. In terms of what you can and can't do from a, a marketing point of, uh, of view, um, just moving on to this next slide, um, if you're marketing um, to sole traders, then um, uh, as I said, um, then that data is treated as personal data and therefore the consent rules uh, apply. If you're marketing to uh, individuals in a business, then again, that's treated as personal data, but the privacy rules allow you to uh, market to those people and provided you provide an opt-out and what you're marketing is actually, um, sorry, is actually relevant to their, their role. Um, where you can market to businesses without any uh, question is when you have generic email addresses. So um, Fred blogs in the account department, that would be personal data and therefore you would only be able to um, market to them stuff relating to their role as, uh, as somebody in the accounts team, um, but accounts at a business um, email address, for example, would uh, you can market to them, but you have to provide an opt out. So generally speaking, in a, in a business to business environment, if you're marketing to business to businesses, you can market to them, but you need to provide opt out, you just need to be wary that there's some some nuances in the in the definitions around what is also personal data as well. But I'm going to be talking mainly about business to consumer um, data when I when I'm talking about this. So this is personal data in the in the strictest sense. Um, so we've got the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation. Um, I'm sure you will have heard of it, um, um, not least of all because you would have read it when when um, you were reading about signing up for this webinar. But um, it's all over. The, the place at the moment, everybody's talking about it, all sorts of organisations are looking at how it impacts on, on their business. Um, it's a, an EU regulation that will be coming to the UK even though we're leaving Europe, so um, don't be fooled into thinking we don't need to worry about it because we're leaving. Um, it still applies, I'm afraid. Um, this fan diagram that hopefully you can see on the screen right now is um, an, uh, uh, a representation of um, 10 of the main changes that are happening. And we haven't got time to go through all of those, but very briefly, I'll just pick out a couple. But the two we'll be focusing on uh, primarily is consent and, 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 a, and a special mention of, of children's data because there's specific rules uh, around that which may be relevant if you're um, looking to market to children and process children's data. Um, so just some very quickly, just some highlights from, from, from uh, some of the changes that are coming. A couple of scope -ish, um, changes, firstly, it's a European regulation, it covers the whole of Europe and, and replaces UK law and other member state law relating to data protection. Um, what it means is that if this member state introduces a law relating to data protection which isn't compliant with GDPR, then GDPR will overrule that um, lo local law and, and will be relevant. Um, and the other scope angle is, um, you remember I mentioned data processes earlier, well under the current UK law, Data Protection Act, um, the uh, data processors have no specific responsibility or responsibility lies with the data controller. Under the GDPR, processors also have responsibility, so um, they um, are likely to be um, expected to answer questions from data controllers about how they are processing the data, what way they'll be processing that data, and, and there's specific rules around um, what processing they can and can't do um, without the um, consent of the data controller. And if something went wrong um, and it was a data processor's fault, it will be the processor that will get into trouble um, rather than specifically the, the controller. So if you are processing data um, for a, a business, um, I'm sorry, for um, 
um, for a data controller, then um, you need to sort of wake up to the concept that you're now you've got more responsibility now than you, you would have had under um, Data Protection Act. Um, and I, I ran a, a webinar um, last week, I think it was, um, a, a specifically around this point, because um, if you're running cloud-based services, for example, suddenly you're a data processor. Um, if you're providing services in the cloud, like the software, for example. And there's been some uh, definitional changes. Um, probably the main one is that uh, online identifiers are now considered personal data. Um, not that they were, were really not considered part of that um, in, in the UK anyway, but um, the GDPR sets that out. Um, there's a couple of in interesting uh, individuals' rights that have been introduced, the right to be forgotten. So um, an individual can ask to have all their data removed from your, your um, your databases and your and your processes. Um, of course, this doesn't mean <laughs> they can say remove all my billing data so that I can't you don't um, don't charge me for a service because that's that's um, that's not what this is about. This is about uh, data that you might be holding for a specific purpose and um, that um, that uh, doesn't require it to be data in a raw sense. It could be anonymized, for example. Um, and the other right that's being introduced is um, the right for data portability, which is um, the ability for a data subject to say they'd like all their data imported out, of, sorry, exported out of your system so they can import it into another system, which may well be a competitor or may well be their own little um, Excel spreadsheet. So they want to do their own processing or um, they just want to have a copy of the data in a specific format. And we're probably going to see quite a lot of standards coming out of, of, of that. Um, there's um, some changes to the way uh, the expectations around documentation and recording how you process um, data. Um, there's the concept of data protection impact assessments and data protection by design, which is making sure that if you're building new stuff or you've, you're introducing a process or you have specific types of processes, then you need to consider the, the ramifications to data protection and privacy. Um, some organizations will need data protection officers. That's what DPOs are people who have specific responsibility within businesses to deliver data protection compliance. Um, and then the last two on that um, uh, fan diagram there, breaches and fines. These are the things that people are, are really worrying about um, and certainly lots of people are talking about. Um, breaches is a notification that you've had a breach and you've had to tell you, uh, a requirement that you, um, and under certain circumstances that you'll need to tell um, possibly the regulator and possibly the um, data subjects themselves that they've had their data breach and if it's data that's particularly harmful for it to be released then uh, undoubtedly you'll need to be reporting that. Um, and then of course the big stick is the fines which uh, um, and under Data Protection Act the uh, Information Commissioner can um, fine up to half a million. Um, they tend to uh, use a proportional, proportionate approach so um, I don't think they've ever fined anybody half a million. I think the largest was 400k for TalkTalk's um, breach back in 2015. Um, and if you look at the um, uh, investigations the Information Commissioner publishes on its website you'll see that generally they're under 100k but under the GDPR they will have the ability to fine under some circumstances, there's two kind of levels, but the top level is 4% of global turnover um, or uh, 20 million euros, depending on which is the highest. Um, so uh, regardless of how big your business is, um, clearly that's uh, um, uh, something to, to think about um, if you're thinking you might just sort of try and ignore this and hope it doesn't um, cause you any grief. But in, in a marketing environment, the, the key challenges are around consent. Um, and the changing rules um, relating to consent. And I'm going to talk about those in a bit more detail, specifically around consent and what that means, um, with a, as a quick mention about children's data, as I said. Um, uh, the issue of third party data, if you're collecting, if you're collecting data from a, another source, how's that going to work? Legacy data, you've got lots of data already, what do you need to do with that? Um, and then essentially as part of any data protection compliance program, ongoing management and how, how you might be, um, need to think, some of the things you might need to think about in, in that respect. So consent, well, the uh, regulation is very clear. You have to um, get give clear messaging. So specifically, um, as re I'll read from the slide, you need to, um, uh, consent is, is any freely given sp specific informed um, and unambiguous indication of data subjects which is by which he or she by a statement by a clear affirmative action signifies agreement to the processing of personal data relating to him or her 
which is a long way of saying you need to be very clear about what it is you're collecting, why you're collecting it, and what you're going to use it for, um, and you need to get a positive opt-in from the data subject. And what that means is, and there's actually mentioned to this in, in the regulation, that um, pre-tick boxes, uh, in, implied um, messaging, um, will mark it to you unless you tell us otherwise. Those kind of messaging um, will no longer be uh, lawful. You will need to have a very specific um, opt-in button or a tick box for somebody to say, yes, I confirm that um, I understand and I will be uh, allowing you to mark it to me or use my data in this particular way. So it has to be clear messaging and it has to be a positive opt-in. And it has to be granular opt-ins in the sense that if you're collecting data for different purposes um, and uh, you need to have an opt-in for each of those purposes. You also can't um, say that um, Consent is by default because um, you, you can't, uh, unless, unless you'll need, you need the data to deliver a service, that's something different, but um, you can't have what's called consent without detriment, which means that um, you're saying, well, you'll have to consent to these things because otherwise we won't deliver the service. That's not allowed. You need to be clear about who you might be sharing the data with. Um, you need to be clear on um, how uh, the subject is able to withdraw their consents at, at, at any particular time. Um, and you need to record and have a record of what it is that you're, what you're collecting and, and when consent was, was given. So in a marketing environment, that means gone are the days of the pre-tick boxes of untick this box if you don't want to be marketed to, or the um, little uh, asterisks pointing you to very small text on a, on a form or, or somewhere else saying to you that you need to um, uh, tick a box or not tick a box, depending on how it's been worded. Um, you have to have very clear messaging, a positive opt-in, lots of information that's very clear. It can't be hidden in terms of conditions. It can't be hidden in privacy policies about what it is you're going to do with that data for marketing purposes and collecting um, uh, the point at which they have opted in to um, you using that data for that purpose. So that's the, the, the main consent thing and certainly um, waking a lot of people up to to the GDPR as well, because, um, because that's a, a real sort of step change um, compared to the um, re rest of the regulation in a general, in a general sense, um, which isn't too far away with what we've got in the UK anyway. Um, but this consent mechanism is, is a real changer. When it comes to children, um, as I said, there's some specific carve-outs in the regulation relating to data um, for uh, relating to children. Um, if you have a service or you're collecting data that is likely to be um, data handed over by children, then um, A, you need to make sure that um, things are worded in a way that a child will understand, which personally I think is not a bad idea for adults anyway. Um, and uh, if it is a child, then you need to get guardian consent. Um, this might mean, depending on how you've got your service set up or how you're collecting your data, you might need to carry out some kind of age verification to be able to determine whether that person is indeed a child and, and therefore um, and they're not just ticking the box saying that they're not. Um, in terms of ages, um, the regulation refers to a child under the age of 16, um, but does allow member states to introduce a, um, a derogation from that, which can be as low as 13 if that's what the national member state wants to, to do. And in fact, there's an indication that the UK government is probably going to go for 13 and under as, as a child, um, which might change some things depending on, on the type of service um, that you might be running that uh, is enabling you to collect children's data. In terms of third party data, um, <laughs> The, the thing that you're going to have to do is if you're collecting data from a, a, a third party for the purposes of marketing, you're going to have to um, carry out due diligence on, on the provider of that data and, and, and the source of where they got it from. And that will be asking for, for them to provide you with proof of consent um, and that uh, everything is, is lawful and above the, above the law as far as the GDPR is concerned. Um, and uh, make sure that you're able to record your approach and, and, and your findings. So if you're found to be collecting data from a source that you don't think can be trusted and, and there's evidence that they've, they've not taken uh, GDPR in, into uh, consideration when they collected the data and collected, con collected the consent, then you're likely to find yourself in, in, uh, in, uh, in a problem with, uh, with the uh, information commissioner in terms of uh, a breach of the, of the regulation. 
Um, and in fact, actually, I, I've not mentioned it, but one of the buzzwords around GDPR is all about accountability, is being able to demonstrate that you, what you're doing is lawful and that you've taken all the relevant steps to ensure that it is lawful. Um, so that it doesn't matter whether you're looking at what processes you might be running and uh, documenting those or having a policy around data protection within your business so that your staff and employees understand their responsibilities or whether it's in inquiring through a third party where they got the data from, what kind of consent was it, did they list you as a, a potential source of um, um, recipient of that data and, and what you were going to use it for. All of those things are all part of um, this accountability that the GDPR is trying to um, uh, implement uh, and push on the, the data controllers or the data processors. So if you're looking at third party data, and I know from a question I had in advance, um, about um, what do we do about external lists and things like that, you're going to have to carry out due diligence of your own against those third parties and ensure that um, they've taken the relevant steps that are GDPR compliant um, to collect that data and provide it to you. And definitely record it so that you've got some evidence should you ever be questioned. And then that brings me on to legacy data. So data that you already have. Um, you might have a mailing list, um, an email list with 10,000 email addresses on it. What do you do about those? Well, whilst the, the information commissioner, and in fact the regulation says this, um, says that um, if, you're, or, um, if you're already, um, there's no, re no need to re-get uh, consent if you've already done it, but obviously the consent has to be GDPR compliant. So if you've already been asking questions and making very clear statements about uh, at the point of collection of your data, that uh, um, is GDPR compliant right now, then your legacy data will be fine. But if there's any data in that data, um, sorry, any, any specific data that hasn't been collected under those circumstances, you may be added a few email addresses your own, whether you've got it from a third party, as we said on the previous slide, um, or um, you're uncertain whether the consent was freely given and well informed and, and everything that applies to GDPR consent, you're gonna have to reassess your data and have a look and see what you need to do about it. Now, this isn't a bad thing, because really you ought to be doing that anyway. Um, from a marketing point of view, it's about making sure you're identifying the people who are really engaging with you, and if you're, um, if you, if you're able to find that balance, then you might want to ditch the data that um, uh, relates to people who don't engage with your campaigns or your marketing and, and focus on getting uh, consent um, from those who um, have been engaging um, with your uh, marketing campaigns. Um, but the thing you've got to be careful about is how you go about um, re-verifying the consent. Um, and so if you have data that you, you think needs to be uh, double-checked on the consent basis, you just need to think about your approach of how you're going to do that. Now, the reason I say that is uh, uh, the information commissioner fined Honda, the uh, car manufacturer recently, because they decided to email a load of people um, whose email addresses they had asking them for consent and um, some people complained and the information commissioner said well actually those people had given those email addresses over for another purpose not for the purposes of marketing asking for consent for marketing is in itself marketing and therefore that's a breach of the uh, marketing regulations um, or in this case uh, the privacy regulations so, um, so they were fine. So that, that, what that means is that if you've got a load of data lying around, you're thinking, actually, we probably ought to seek consent or re-seek re consent for, for the use of this data, but those people haven't necessarily had marketing information from you before, or you don't use marketing on a regular basis, you're not going to be able to email them to ask um, for consent. You're going to have to look at um, alternative means. Uh, the most obvious one um, as long as they've not opted out for either mail preference services to write them a letter. Um, and the other thing to bear in mind is when you're re-verifying consent is not to be saying things like, we'll assume you're okay to carry on with uh, our marketing information um, um, unless you tell us otherwise. You can't do that because that's not a positive uh, affirmation um, from the uh, data subject. You, you will need to direct them to a website or tell them to respond to the email to confirm that they're happy and you'll need to make sure your email's obviously worded or your, your letter's worded properly to ensure um, the, the consents that they're now giving you afresh is, is compliant with the GDPR. And as I say, that third box along there, uh, opportunity to refresh your data, is, is not look at this as a, a burden 
but actually look at it as an opportunity to have a look at what data you've got, what's working, what's not, and focus your marketing efforts on the data that's working and, and therefore focus your maybe your uh, re-verifying consents on, on those that uh, are engaging with you. And whatever you do, record and provide uh, your own documentation so that if you're ever quizzed about it, you are able to say, well, this person re-verified their consent at this particular point, and this is the me mechanism that we used it, and the reason we did it was this way. If you've got documentary evidence, you've got policies and processes and procedures in place on anything to do with data protection, not just marketing, and not just consent, but anything to do with data protection, you're probably going to be in a better position should you be investigated um, or if somebody complains than if you've, you can't demonstrate that you've even thought about it. Because um, if you've not thought about it, then uh, it, as the saying said, goes, ignorance is, is not, uh, doesn't mean that you, and the law doesn't apply. Um, you you will, won't get away with it if, you, if you've not put any thoughts on any of this. So record your approach, your findings, your policies, your pro, um, the procedures and everything you're doing relating to your consent mechanism and certainly in terms of legacy data, how you're seeking out consent um, afresh, if indeed you need to. So how does this all translate into ongoing management? So you've got yourself to being GDPR compliant, you've, you've done that ahead of time or in time for the um, uh, 25th of May 2018 deadline, um, but actually the thing um, that a lot of businesses forget is that data protection isn't just a, a box ticking exercise, this is something that's, that is, is there all of the time and um, you'll need to make sure you have policies and processes um, and uh, take certain actions to ensure that you continue to be compliant. So when we're talking about marketing and particularly marketing consent, that, that will mean you'll need to consider um, refreshing your, uh, your data and, and, and the quality of it. Um, and specifically just reaffirming that the people who have been receiving your marketing information are, are happy to continue to do so. There, there's no specific rules and, uh, around it, it from a GDPR point of view about how regular that should be, but there is an indication in, in um, a new set of privacy regulations, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, that indicates that you might want to do it every six months. Um, again, if you've got your approach and your and, and evidence that you've thought about it and you you believe that you're doing the right thing, um, documented, then then that stands you in a better place than just thinking, well, we won't worry about this right now and uh, just hope that we don't get found out because if you, as I said before, if you don't have any documentary evidence and policy and processes, then you're going to find yourself um, truly stuck when it if it, if you uh, if somebody complains or the information commissioner gets to find out about it. Um, you need to make sure that your processes include an easy uh, ability for somebody to withdraw their consent and that you make note of that. So um, having a, an email system where somebody can click on the unsubscribe button, if they do that, then you need to make sure that their data is removed from your, your own database. If you're sharing it with a third party for the processes, uh, purposes of processing for, for marketing, then they need to make sure that they don't carry on sending um, uh, marketing information out. Um, and, um, and so you need a, a process or a system in place to make sure that you're recording when people are withdrawing their consent. Um, and as I said, document your approach um, and make sure everybody's um, trained and up to date with, with their responsibilities. So if you're, if you're in a, a large marketing team, make sure everybody has had some data protection training um, uh, and that, that training is, is specific to um, marketing uh, people. Um, in a general sense, uh, when we talk about data protection compliance, it's important that the whole business understands um, what their responsibilities are, um, but there are specific rules like marketing where you ought to have specific training as well. So how do you get your marketing data, your marketing systems, GDPR compliance? Well, actually this, this process that I've got on, on here, these five um, squares uh, or rectangles, they are um, the same as it was if, if you were looking at a, um, a holistic view of the whole of a, a business. It's about preparing your business or in, in marketing sense, maybe your marketing team about the GDPR, make sure that you've got this, the buy-in at a senior level to ensure you can actually go ahead and, and focus on um, delivering compliance. Um, and if required, you've got a bunch of people together that are gonna take the responsibility and the lead for that compliance. 
Um, so maybe that may be including um, in a marketing environment you've also got your marketing people that might be people within your um, other teams who make use of marketing data for, for whatever purpose your um, IT guys who look after your systems that you use and, and so on um, but it's important that you build a, 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 a basically a, a project board or a working group to actually drive forward the compliance You've then got to audit your systems and your data and your policies and look at making coming up with a register of those three things so that you can see what you've actually got to work with. Um, depending on your business, you might already have those kind of things in place. Um, and then you move on to the analysis. That's looking at what you've got, what data, what systems, what policies, and what needs to change and how you're going to go about changing them. You then move to your delivery um, uh, phase which is actually delivering an action plan of, of how we're going to get ourselves compliant by the 25th of May 2018 and an element of that will be making sure that the relevant people are trained and up to date with, with what's changing. And I've already talked about ongoing compliance and management as I said data protection is a one-off exercise, it's something that you need to, to do on a continual basis um, and so you need to make sure you've got plans in place to do with uh, ongoing compliance and from a marketing point of view that's all going to be around consent and how people might be withdrawing their consent making sure you're up to date with the regulations and the changes um, and you make sure that your staff are fully briefed on um, what, what it is that they're expected to do under under the GDPR so what else do you need to think about well I mean the talks about GDPR and marketing but actually in a truer sense um, there's much more uh, a more wider regulatory framework in, in play here. Um, you may have seen on the news, it was certainly being led as a, new, a primary news story on the BBC on Monday, that the government's announced its plans for a data protection bill. Well, we, we knew about that anyway because it was in the Queen's speech in June. Um, but the data protection bill um, essentially will ratify the general data protection regulation in, in UK law and will replace the existing data protection act so we can probably expect a data protection act 2018 um, but also according to the plans there's some other things that the government are looking at um, um, on, on introducing and depending on how you read those plans you could say well maybe the government's looking at um, sort of making some things more stricter than the GDPR requires so, so um, from a law point of view provided the principles of GDPR apply in a national law. There's nothing that stops any member state going above and beyond that um, if they've got specific um, controls in place that they, they want to, or specific ideas in place that they want to set, set up um, for, for control. So data protection bill is certainly something to keep your eye on. We're probably going to see the wording for that in September um, when it gets presented to the parliament for a, a, an initial reading. So we'll have a better idea about exactly what it is that um, is, uh, is is actually going to be in the in the in the law, um, but essentially, I think the key point here is that it will ratify the GDPR in UK law, and that will be a, important because of Brexit. And and you'll notice that one of the symbols on there is is a Brexit symbol because um, Brexit will also have an impact on this. We'll we'll go from being um, a, a a data controlling data within the EU to being somebody outside and that implements uh, that introduces a number of other complexities around processing of data of EU citizens when you're not in the EU or how you transfer your data outside of of the EU and, and so on um, so uh, data protection bill is something to keep an eye on as is the, the the outcome of what it might mean to data protection when we leave Europe We've, I've mentioned it a couple of times, um, the e-privacy regulations, this is a new set of regulations again coming from Europe, they're in a draft phase at the moment and are being debated in the various, uh, or going through the various hoops that um, European re regulation has to go through, but they're, they're pushing hard because they want this to be implemented at the same time as the general data protection regulation. And again, because it will be a regulation, it will apply to the whole of Europe and be, again, if I get it in next year, we won't have left Europe, so it will still be applicable. Um, but the e-privacy rules, so there's an e-privacy directive, um, determines certain things. Uh, the most famous one is, is cookie control and how, how we use cookies on websites and, and, and what you can and can't do with them and the cookie statements and things like that. So they're hoping to simplify that. But as, as I mentioned earlier, um, the e-privacy um, rules also set out how marketing works in a, in a marketing environment. 
and they play along with the consent rules within the GDPR, but they also set out what you can do through telephone marketing, email marketing, fax marketing, if people still do that, um, and uh, text marketing. Um, what that might look like, we don't really know. Um, there is a draft. It's probably not going to introduce, in the marketing sense, too many differences to um, the marketing regimes, um, the consent in GDPR being the main change. Um, but again, this is something that's probably going to be uh, regulated in the UK in, in some particular way. There's certainly a lot of derogations allowed, for example, how you market to businesses um, that are, are set out uh, as, as a member state law rather than a specific European regulation. Um, but again, it's another piece of regulation, particularly for marketers, um, for you to keep an eye on. Um, the two uh, hexagons in the middle, the yellow and the blue one, um, guidance. We, we've got a whole host of guidance coming. The Article 29 Working Party, this, this is a European group of regulators who get together and come up with their uh, interpretation of certain elements of the regulation and law. They've already produced some kinds of guidance, but they will be producing guidance on consent. The Information Commissioner, that's our regulator, um, who is likely to still be our regulator post-Brexit as well. Um, they have a draft consent document, which they consulted on. They promised that we would see the final version in the summer. Well, we're rapidly coming to the end of summer. If you look out the window and see the rain, you think we've probably passed that already anyway. Um, but um, the thing about that consent guidance is that they're probably not going to deliver that now until they've got the Article 29 Working Party consent guidance. So whilst I'm talking to you here saying you need to think about all of these things to do with consent, there's a good chance that we might get some gu guidance at some point this year that, that might um, might tweak some of those approach, um, approaches in, in particular ways. So you need to keep an eye on what's happening with those uh, pieces of guidance and particularly um, the UK's guidance um, and how that factors into the Data Protection Act of next year and, um, and how things work in the UK. And then of course, come May 20, 2018, when the regulation becomes law, we'll start seeing um, the regulators enforcing the regulation um, we'll maybe see some cases as we do today under Data Protection Act where fines are, um, are given and investigations are carried out and, and, and declarations of interpretation are, are made. Um, it's, this really means, with all of those things on that slide right now, um, that the next few years are, are, are going to be very fluid in terms of uh, interpretation of regulations, bills, local laws, um, privacy regulations, guidance, what happens with Brexit and, 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 uh, and case precedent and enforcement that might come out of uh, individual cases. So as a marketer or indeed anybody who has to think about data protection compliance, not just marketing people of course, um, there's a lot to be thinking of uh, and thinking about and also keeping an eye on, um, as I say, probably over the next couple of years. And going back to my little diagram that just had the two arrows, data protection and privacy, what that means for the future of marketing compliance is that we need to think about general data protection regulation and the consent rules as to what that means for our marketing. We need to think about the privacy regulations and how they're implemented in the UK and what that means for marketing. We need to think about the data protection bill, which will become a data protection act, um, probably 2018, um, and what that means for marketing. Um, and we need to wait for guidance we need to pick up on any precedents that are set, set, which whilst we're part of Europe, potentially means uh, um, any European regulators, uh, precedents that they might set as well um, around the interpretation of how that impacts on marketing. Um, so that's sort of a summary slide of what I just said about all these uh, key factors that are, are um, influencing what happens with uh, marketing um, under GDPR and, and, and well, marketing compliance in general, to be honest, not just GDPR. So that, that's pretty much the bulk of what I wanted to cover in terms of GDPR and uh, marketing. Um, very quick sales pitch about how, what kind of things I offer as a service um, to so that you can see how I might be able to help you. So if you're sat there thinking, blimey, there's a lot for us to do, how can we get help? One of the services I run is the Digital Compliance Hub. This is an online subscription service that uh, actually covers a, a, a vast range of subjects, not just data protection, but also privacy and marketing compliance and, and, and data and, and uh, web security. Um, it's part information and guidance so with some tools. So there's a, an audit tool, for example, that will lead you through the various aspects of carrying out a data protection audit. Um, and it's part 
uh, support and uh, help when you when you need it. So there's unlimited email support included in the subscription, as well as um, it's limited, but there is telephone support as well. So there's some hotlines that you can use uh, should you use it. And some businesses, in fact, are looking at it more from a how do we how do we have somebody on our books that we can just call on um, and using the subscription as the way of doing that for sort of ad hoc queries that they might have. Um, and if you sign up now. Um, you can try it for a, a month for free, um, so you can have a look and uh, uh, and uh, see what what's on there, and and obviously make use of the support and help as well. And I say if you do it now, um, because probably from September the 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 trial may not be for a full free month. And uh, if if you're looking for something more specific, then I also through Flavor by Digital, my my main business, that's a consultancy business. Um, I can offer you the, the help and you need from any aspect of GDPR. So that's anything from uh, specific consultancy projects through to carrying out audits um, and making sure that you've got an understanding of what you need to do and you've got a, a, an action plan in, in place. Um, and I also um, offer a service on a, a retainer basis to uh, help businesses uh, as a data protection manager. Um, so it's a couple of a, a days, a, a month. Um, and that includes an audit as well. And then, of course, the other services I've already mentioned is Digital Compliance Hub. So, as I catch my breath, um, as, a, as a bit of a, a whistle stop of GDPR and how it impacts on marketing, um, we've got a about 15 minutes for, for some questions. Um, hopefully, um, that was useful. Let me see if we've got any questions coming through. Um, as I said, in your. Uh, yeah, got a few coming through. Um, as I said, in your control panel, you should be able to see um, a uh, question section, and that's where you can type your question. So I'm just going to have a quick look and see what we've got. Right, so quite a common question um, from Joe uh, about running lots of events. How can we um, recommend that uh, contacts and attendees uh, are properly opting in um, to keep um, the database for, for future events. Well, it doesn't matter whether you're collecting data um, in, in paper form at registration on an event um, front desk or, or whether you're collecting it from your website on a contact form. If you're collecting data for the purposes of marketing, then any um, uh, information that you, uh, so all the information you provide needs to be clear and you need to be clear that you're going to use it for marketing of future events and provide tick boxes for them to to, 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 to tick to authorize that they're consenting to uh, um, the use of their data for that purpose. So uh, I'm afraid you're, you're going to have to, uh, well, you need to look at your processes about how you sign people up for, for um, your mailing lists for uh, future events and uh, make sure your wording and your opting in is, is clear enough for uh, satisfying the requirements of the GDPR. Uh, okay, another common question um, from Jacqueline um, about uh, B2B email marketing and whether you need to get consent. Um, so, so there's this question of when business data is actually personal data in the eyes of the data protection regulations. Um, as I said, certain types of businesses, um, they are considered as personal data. So sole traders, for example, that their data is personal data and therefore you will need consent for the purposes of marketing. Certain kinds of partnerships, not, not big partnerships like um, limited liability partnerships, you know, LLPs, which you tend to see with accountancy companies or um, um, law firms. Um, but certain types of partnerships, their data um, or the partners in those partnerships, their data is also personal data, so you would need consent. If you, where, where things change is if you've got actual business data outside of those, those um, ones we were just talking about. Um, so in a business environment, if you've got a generic business email address, so accounts at or info at or support at or um, you know, directors at or something like that, and it's not targeting somebody specific, you don't need consent, but you do need to provide opt-out. However, a, personal's, a person's individual or employee's individual email address within that business um, would be considered personal data. And in practice, you would need to have consent, therefore. However, the privacy regulations, the, the, which is the privacy electronic communication regulations right now, but as I said earlier, they may be changing because of the new e-privacy regulations coming in from Europe as well. Um, they currently say, that um, 
if you you can market to an individual within a business provided it's relevant to their role within that business and you provide an opt-out so the, the key in both of those instances is you're providing an opt-out and you're honoring that that opt-out um, there's just slight nuance in the fact that if it's a, a not a generic um, email address for the business and it's a, a person a, an employee within that business you have to make sure you're only marketing stuff that's relevant to them okay sorry there's quite a few questions coming through um, so uh, a question So uh, again, actually, these are all good questions. Um, one I get asked a lot is, is, is the point I made about the Honda case with um, if you've got a, uh, um, if you're thinking of re-emailing your existing database to get them to positively opt in and give consent, um, you need to be careful about how you do that. Um, so, th so this is really around, so there's an element of where that data has come from and what you might be using it for. So in the Honda case, it was actually very specific. They had emails from showrooms that um, uh, were probably given for um, made emailing out a brochure for a car that somebody's popped into the showroom and, and said they wanted a copy of, but they hadn't uh, consented to the use of that data for marketing. Um, and what the Information Commission is very clear is seeking consent for the purposes of marketing is in itself marketing. So if you don't have consent for marketing, then you can't use email as a way to, to market to those people. That also means you can't use email as the tool that you use to ask them to opt in to um, giving uh, the affirmative consent that you need under GDPR. If you're already mar marketing to people and they receive a regular email, maybe once a month, you're constantly emailing them and you provide them with opt out and all those kind of things, then you could argue that they have come to suspect and expect you to be marketing to them because they've been on your list for some time. Um, and therefore you could use email as a tool for doing that but if there's any doubt you'll have to look at alternative means and um, the most obvious one but quite expensive I guess um, would be using snail mail or, or the post um, because um, the rules around that are that provided they haven't opted out of uh, postal marketing by the mail preference service then you can mail to those people as much as you like um, where for email there's very strict controls. So, um, so Jackie, I hope that uh, answers your question. Um, it, it's really, I mean, it, as a, as it's always been with data protection, it's about the expectation of the purpose of which somebody's giving you data. If there's no expectation that they would get marketing information from you, um, then then you you can't use email to um, seek consents, and you shouldn't be using email for marketing anyway. Um, for those people. Um, the rules are different if they're your clients because there's certain rules that allow you to, to email relevant things uh, relating to your business for, for existing clients. Um, but in a general sense, you can't email market. You can't use email to ask people for consent for marketing unless they've consented to the marketing. Is, is essentially what I'm trying to say. Right, so I've got a question about what happens if you co are contracted to a data processor based in the US um, who, is, who is unlikely to be compliant. Well, if you're already doing that, then you're in breach of the Data Protection Act because that requires you to only contract with data processors outside the European Union who have uh, agreed to providing ad adequate controls. Um, and the Data Protection Directive, which is what the Data Protection Act is based on, that's being replaced by the General Data Protection Regulation, they both talk about adequate controls from from what they call third countries so countries outside the EU of which will become one when we when we leave the EU as well it's worth noting that um, but countries outside the EU have to have adequate controls and they have to have either contractual controls in place that that stipulate that here's our data we have to apply by the data protection act or the general data protection regulation and you will have to as well and you will have to carry out due diligence and uh, make sure that you have a contract and a policy and you've carried out proper due diligence and you've recorded what you've done to ensure that there is no chance that they're going to have a breach from a security point of view or that they're going to misuse your data. So you're essentially asking them to sign up to the European standard of data protection. Um, but that's always been the case and, and doesn't really change. Where things start getting interesting with the GDPR is the change in the fact that actually cloud-based services 
are probably storing data in various countries for the purposes of delivering their service um, and uh, there is a, 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 um, a certain amount of due diligence a controller would have to, to carry out against those services. So in, in, in essence, there's no, no different. But basically, if you're passing data outside the EU, you need to make sure that their processes are compliant with EU standards of data protection um, and there are certain ways in which that can be done um, that exist under data protection right now as well as uh, the GDPR going forward. Gosh, there's lots of questions. I'm not sure we're going to get through all of them, so let me just quickly scan through and I'll, I'll, um, I'll try and respond to them uh, maybe offline um, for some of the ones we don't get to. Okay. Uh, right. So, um, a question about um, data brokers and, and buying email from um, or buy, buying in personal emails um, from a, a third party it goes back to what I said before about you, you're going to have to carry out due diligence and be sure that you believe that they've collected those data that data within the, the rules and, and the restrictions of the, the GDPR. Um, and there is this question of whether they were, were asked that you're, they were collecting the data on your behalf as well and, and you've got to have to find that balance. This is one of the areas that we really need the consent guidance on. Um, but in, in essence, if you're getting data from a third party or, um, and you're planning on getting new data, you need to make sure that they've collected that data in a GDPR compliant way. Um, and that includes um, statements around uh, the way that they collected the data, how they've collected it, what consent's been given, how that consent's been given. So, I mean, going forward, I guess part of your question, um, Haley, is around, you know, a data broker is probably going to have all of that mechanism in place. You as a, as a data controller or somebody who wants to use that data for marketing purposes is going to have to make sure that you're picking the right data brokers that have followed the rules and the regulations because you'll get it um, uh, in the neck if you don't. Um, so uh, you'll need to make sure that they Correct your consent in the right in the right way. Otherwise, you'll um, find yourself uh, in trouble. Okay, I'm going to take this uh, one last question, um, which I'm just uh, quickly reading now, um, and then I'm going to have to end the seminar, um, the webinar, because um, we're getting close to, to one o'clock. Um, Some of these questions are ones I've asked already, so just bear with me. Um, um, here's, a, here's, a, here's a great question um, uh, from Jenny about marketing automation. Oh, I can't say it. Marketing automation platforms and um, that may be doing some profile um, uh, processing um, to determine who might be better leads. This is a really interesting question. Um, and actually covers quite a, a vast range of, of um, potential issues. Uh, one I commonly get asked about is Facebook and the fact that you can pump a load of emails into Facebook and it will identify for purposes of advertising on Facebook similar users on Facebook um, that meet the same kind of profile as the ones that you're already working with. If you haven't asked to, to um, have that data for that purpose, so you haven't got the consent to use that data for profiling basis, whether that's using it in a third party system like Facebook or using your own marketing automation uh, platform. And you in, in practice can't use that data for, for those purposes. You will need to say uh, one of your tick boxes for, for opting into the processing is that you would like to use their data for the purposes of profiling. Um, and uh, therefore, um, if you don't have that consent, then you can't use it for that, that profiling, um, which I, 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 I do understand um, is, is a, a challenge for certain types of businesses and, and certain types of things that they might be doing. But in essence, if you're processing data that you haven't got consent for the purpose, that, sorry, that specific purpose, then it's a breach of the regulations because the regulations say you must seek active consent, sorry, affirmative consent to process it and if you want to use the data for multiple purposes, purposes um, and then you will need to make sure you've got consent for all of those purposes. So I, I hope that answers your question. Um, 
So that uh, brings us to uh, pretty much one o'clock. In fact, the clock's just ticked over to, to 1,300 hours. Um, I'm sorry I didn't get through all of those questions. I will try and uh, keep a record of them and, and uh, uh, send you some uh, emails in, in reply for the ones I didn't respond to, so apologies for that. But um, it, this was, uh, as you'd expect, quite a, a popular session in terms of um, marketing and, and the GDPR, so uh, I'm, I'm pleased that we had so many questions. I'm just sorry I couldn't get through them all. Um, but uh, feel free to ping me an email if you suddenly think, you, oh, I wish I had a chance to ask um, something, then uh, I'll see what I can do in terms of replying to those. But um, thank you very much for joining this uh, webinar. I hope you found it useful, and um, maybe catch you on another one in the future. Thanks.